So I thought I will share all this experience with the um, uh, view towards uh, how to, uh, you know, have a essential of form and function so that, you know, you can have a principles as well as practice of plastic surgery from the plastic, I mean, orthognathic surgery from the plastic surgeon's perspective. So what is orthognathic surgery? Orthognathic surgery involves the surgical manipulation of the elements of the facial skeleton. So to restore the proper anatomic and functional relationship in patients with dentofacial skeletal anomalies. Principles used in orthognathic surgery also can be used to manage a broad spectrum of maxillofacial abnormalities, which usually result from congenital developmental acquired or even other traumatic and uh, cancer deformities for following ablations. So history wise, a few words because um, right from 1846 onwards, people have been trying to uh, do some sort of uh, movement of these uh, hard bones in the face. And they have been finding it extremely difficult because of the shortage of the good instrumentation as well as uh, proper, uh, I mean, uh, uh, lack of anatomical knowledge about the uh, skeletal forces which are employed in the facial uh, skeleton. So all put together, slowly, slowly, it is an evolution over a period of time. All of you should read this uh, 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 paper by orthognathic surgery and a tale of how three procedures came to be. That is, um, uh, it is written by uh, none other than uh, Aubrey sir in clinics in plastic surgery in 2007, he brilliantly describes how his uh, teacher Droner uh, came and uh, did one of the, uh, uh, you know, osteotomies on the right side. And then he told, OK, you can do it on the other side uh, with the, your sagittal split. So he goes on to tell how this patient, you know, slowly, it was such a difficult to operate in dental chair under local anesthesia, patient almost aspirating. and it is a journey. This man really carried through the, the maxillofacial journey and truly he is the um, father figure in uh, maxillofacial surgery and orthognathic surgery. There are a few couple of uh, uh, osteotomies which were done early as Vasamund in 1927, Shushart in uh, 1942 and Kazanjian also did it in 1950. So Obviously, sir, actually for the first time in 1965, he fully mobilized the maxilla in a single step, brought it into the predictable position. So that is why he always felt that, okay, fine, here now I have reached after about 20 years, right from 1942 onwards up to 65, I have struggled and now I've been able to achieve the movement of the maxilla in one single unit and in a single step. And I have brought it to the required position, whether it is anteriorly or posteriorly, which I'll come into the later stages. This is an interesting uh, 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 slide in which uh, uh, you can see on the right extreme uh, uh, that is uh, Paul Tezier presenting the uh, paper of his craniofacial series and asking all these great eminent maxillofacial surgeons and uh, other plastic surgeons. Um, Obviously, sir, is right on the extreme corner here. So um, he's asking that whether should I really continue with this craniofacial surgery or no? So, Aussie's genioplasty procedures were started with 1942 in Hofer, and in 1957, they described the Troner and Hobbes' uh, intraoral approach to Aussie's genioplasty. So, this is the one which I just talked to you about. Troner was his uh, senior consultant, and um, he did it on one side very quickly and extraoral, and then Hobbes has to struggle to do the sagittal split on the other side. So historically, the ability to reposition the mandible in a stable manner long preceded the ability to reposition the maxilla because maxilla is much more compact structure and extremely difficult anatomically to disassemble as well as to uh, do the uh, these type of procedures. So as a consequence, what happened was these many patients, they underwent only mandibular surgery to correct a primary maxillary deformity. So think that, let us say a person has got a maxillary hypoplasia. So a normal mandible looks or, uh, prognathic. So in our, instead of doing a maxillary advancement, 
they have gone ahead and then done the mandibular setback. This is what I am telling you. So as a consequence, many of these patients underwent only mandibular surgery to correct a primary maxillary deformity. So the speciality of orthognathic surgery did not fully develop until Ob Vegister demonstrated the possibility and reported simultaneous repositioning of the maxilla and mandible in 1970, which we popularly call nowadays as the bimaxillary surgery. So what is the problem when we come to think of it? The word orthognathic comes from the Greek word orgos, means to straighten and gnacos means jaw. The orthognathic surgery thus means to straighten a jaw. Defining a straight jaw versus one that is not requiring determining the degree of deviation from a specified population norm. However, restoring the orthognathic form of the face ultimately depends upon achieving the ideal facial aesthetics of the individual patient, not simply restoring the average normal values of a population. As a plastic surgeon, I keep on telling that the two essential uh, aspects of any reconstruction is the form and the function. And a plastic surgeon's life is almost a constant battle between a beauty and the blood supply. So we have to keep on thinking that, you know, where at uh, what maximum I can stretch this operation at the same time, I'm not going to devascularize that area. So remember that face is not just an upper and a lower jaw, it is more than that. So always I keep telling that, look here, don't go into the you know real anatomical or the physical standards of the face, though of course it is extremely important to know that uh, for doing these procedures. However, the overall appearance of the face is, uh, is the most important. That is the appearance overall as a sort of, you know, uh, uh, how the person appeals to you. The person may have a, um, you know, blunt tipped nose or the person may be having a, uh, not having a little bit of squint eyes or person has got a little bit of uh, disproportionate between the maxilla and the mandible. However, overall appearance, if it is very charming, I guess I think you, you don't have to do anything that way. So, the orthognathic or maxillofacial surgery is a subset of craniofacial surgery because when these deformities extend to involve the craniorbital skeleton, the evaluation management expands the scope of maxillo towards the craniofacial surgery. <clears throat> As you can see that there are various uh, uh, dentofacial deformities and they will come into it. So these are some of the uh, uh, correction requirements which involves the skeletal evaluation with the standardized radiographs, a dental evaluation with the study dental cost and formulation of a treatment plan, which is very important. Nowadays, you have got even 3D models and even stereolithographic models and even 3D uh, printing uh, mock surgery models are available. So you can even use a, uh, unlike uh, uh, previously we used to bank upon only on a X-ray tracings of a cephalogram, which I'll come to you in a little bit later. So unlike many surgical procedures, outcome usually, it does not rely only on the surgical procedure, but also on the multitude of factors, which begin long before the actual surgery, as well as in control and variables long after the surgery. It is almost like an architect. You first envisage a plan, and then you already have it in your mind how the house is going to come after the built up of the uh, procedure is over. And if there are any shortcomings during the execution, so obviously it is not going to match what exactly you had in your dream. So coming to the etiology, the dentofacial skeletal abnormalities occur usually as a result of a difference in growth or the upper facial skeleton to the lower facial skeleton. It results in a discrepancy of the normal relationship that exists between the upper and the lower jaw. And underlying genetic predisposition and acquired causes can also influence the normal growth of the fa facial skeleton. The congenital anomalies like uh, upper syndrome and Crozen syndrome or facial clefts, they also affect the normal growth and development. So also some of the traumatic events, as you can see in these slides, this lady had a um, uh, road traffic accident and then following with she had a sort of the span facial fractures and then you can see a dish face deformity and then mole occlusion. So these also develop a facial skeleton can disturb the normal subsequent growth and then 
other etiologies like uh, uh, neoplastic growth surgical resection and iatrogenic radiation of late in the of, during the covid season we had lot of these um, uh, maxillary uh, deformities following ablation following mucormycosis in one of the papers we presented before the onset of this covid we had only about 8 cases from our department over a spanning over a period of 10 years and in these 2 uh, years of covid post covid mucormycosis of the maxilla was such a common affair if we almost uh, have a, a record of another 40 to 50 i think it is all over it is universal many of the other units also so i spurt in the growth of, i mean of this uh, deformities in uh, during this covid season just a minute it's uh, ah. so the clinical examination uh, evaluates the skeletal evaluation with a standardized uh, radiographs followed by a dental evaluation you can see that and these are the cephalometric analysis and x-ray tracing is done and then the analysis is done then prediction tracing based on the lifford one osteotomy followed by dental model models and then doing a mock surgery here so uh, orthodontic alignment decompensation and coordination of the dental arches is an extremely important steps when you plan to do this orthodontic surgeries stating so the clinical assessment is evaluating the relative position and size of each of the facial skeletal elements the degree of zygomatic projection the nasolabial angle the position of maxilla and the mandible compared to each other and to the cranio orbital region cervico mental angle all these things need to be documented any facial asymmetry should be noted along with the relationship of the maxillary dental and line to the mandible dental midline and then intraoral examination should focus on the dental alignment and the arch and relationship of the dental arches to the to each other as we can see that we all know about this the facial balance typically is assessed by dividing the face into thirds the upper third is the form from the anterior hairline to the glabella and the middle third from the glabella to the subnasal lower third is from the subnasal or to the menton the lower third may further divided into upper third that is the up to the subnasal to the oral commissure lower two thirds that is the oral commissure to the menton you also should have a uh, profile view so that you know you have a slight degree of convexity as is measured from the glabella to the subnasal to the uh, menton so it should be something like that coming you know like a gentle convex curvature so looking to the profile the following items are important which i already told you and uh, from the frontal these are some of the important thing the midline the symmetry however symmetry is important but i also keep on telling that uh, it's you should up, uh, have more emphasis on the proportions than the symmetry itself so the muscle activity of the lower lip and the chin tooth to the lip relationship the lip length facial contour head to body proportion so as i was mentioning the gentle curve which could, should come in an angle of convexity start from the glabella up to the root of the nose and then up to the menton should be like this if, if it is too convex it will look like this with a prognath i mean uh, retrogenia if it is too much it is a maxillary hypoplasia as well as uh, the class 3 type of dental occlusion which will happen here so that maxillofacial deformities can be divided conveniently into dental dysplasias skeletal dysplasias and dental skeletal dysplasias so the dental dysplasias are usually limited strictly to mal occlusions and abnormal spatial relations of the dentition not from the skeletal portion of the upper and the lower jaws 
these can usually be corrected by orthodontic treatment. Now the skeletal dysplasias are the one which are where we come into the picture. In patients with uh, this type, the dentition is in a good alignment as you can see here. However, the uh, mandible or the maxilla may be dysplastic or hypoplastic depending on the case it may be. Here it is a case of a, uh, you can see that, you know, uh, craniofacial microsomia as well as from the, uh, you can see the hollowness on the left side, whereas on the normal side on the right side. Now, dentoskeletal dysplasias are a little different ball game. Here, the dentition is small position within each arch and with each other. Additionally, the skeletal relationship of the upper and the lower jaws is abnormal. So an example is a patient with a maxillary sagittal and transverse with width deficiency from a facial cleft. However, correction requires aligning the dentition. That is, of course, you have to give a great amount of contribution to this orthognathy surgery from the Department of Orthodontics. Without their help, you, you can be nowhere in the management of these type of cases. The restoring of the maxillary mandibular dental relationship with skeletal osteotomy. Now the indications are facial dysmorphism with or without functional implications. So the restoration of the normal anatomical relationship between the maxilla and mandible is related to the cranial base, re-establishes the functional components of uh, form and function of the facial skeleton. Always you should uh, keep it in mind when you're doing these surgeries. We all know about this, the dentition, the dental notations is called as the universal dental notation, how the teeth are named it starts usually number one to eight from the upper on the right side and then goes on from nine to 16 on the left side. Again, same thing, it starts from 16, I mean 17 to 32 like that. So this I will not go into details. So these are some of the uh, things which are dental notations. Mesial means towards the dental line. Distal means away from the dental, labial means towards the lips, buccal means towards the cheek. <clears throat> so 1901, actually Edward Angle observed that they classified the uh, occlusion classification. So this is also called as the uh, Angle's classification of uh, one, two and three. One is called as a neutral occlusion in which the mesolabial cusp of the maxillary first molar, this is the first molar, articulates within the mesiobuccal groove of the mandibular first molar. Now, angle class two, what happens is, uh, it happens the mandible first molar articulates distal to the mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar. You can see here. So, it gives us some sort of a retrogenia here. And angle three is wherein you can see that it is more distally. So, obviously, the mandible appears more prognathic. So, these are some of the three essential classifications of the occlusion, however, it is only showing the anterior and the posterior displacements. There can be a lateral class cross bite, there can be an anterior over bite, there can be a distal, uh, you know, various other uh, types which can happen with this. As you can see here, there can be a overjet, over bite, a cross bite, a deep bite, <laughs> and a open bite. So this is endless actually. So there are so many uh, uh, things which keeps on coming onto this. So whenever we do that, we do something called as the dental compensations. So the prognathism, the lower incisors may be flared towards the tongue side and the upper incisors are flared labial to compensate for the class 3 molar occlusion. Hence, in conversely, the mandibular deficiency, as you can see here, the mandibular dentition is flared labial. We can see that it is flared labial. Okay. And then the maxillary dentition is flared away from the lingual. So there is another thing called as a centric relation and the centric occlusion. Just to make sure that, you know, the occlusion may be fine, but in ideal situation, when the patient is in the centric occlusion, the condyle or glenoid should be in the proper position. However, due to some laxity of the TMJ uh, fibers in and around, even the occlusion may be okay, but still the joint may not be in proper uh, good position. 
So now coming to contraindications for these surgeries, there are underlying medical conditions, bleeding, dyscrasia, systemic disease, local factors, you know, which may affect the normal wound healing, especially something like, you know, mucormycosis, compromised vascularity of the surgical region, like uh, post-radiation therapy, and a patient, of course, with a very unrealistic expectations, a non-compliant patient, and patients with poor oral hygiene. So these are some of the contraindications. Otherwise, this is fairly an established procedure, and if it is well uh, um, uh, worked up, it should give predictable results. These are some of the uh, imaging which will, first is the clinical photographs. We all are plastic surgeons, we don't have to know about these things. In So it has to be lips in repose and then in all the three, four angles. And then you have to have a, a skeletal evaluations with a OPG, a 3D CT scan, and then a cephalometric x-rays, especially the lateral one, which will help you in analysis of the cephalograms. So the analysis of the dentofacial skeleton is based on an identifiable radio, radiographic landmarks on a lateral cephalometric X-ray. So these are some of the, the standard uh, uh, points which are noted down on the anatomical regions. And this is the anterior nasal spine. There's a nasion, that is a gonion, that is a pogonion, you know, like the menton. So these are some of the uh, planes which are there based on which the maxilla and the mandible positions are related spatially to each other to the cranial base. So you can see that during the analysis, you can always have many of these uh, cephalometric analysis which will give you whether the distance is less or more and depending on various conditions. Nowadays, of course, the, the three-dimensional CT is increasingly being used, including the three models printing, which has become very cheap. Now, I think about 2,000 to 4,000 rupees, they'll give you a model for mock surgery with a 3D CT. So pre-operative planning using 3D CT offers multiple potential advantages, including the ability to easily consider multiple different surgical approaches to a problem, and then the ability to characterize and then to tailor make each procedure for the patient. So with the advancing technology, this 3D visualization of the patients may replace totally the 2D cephalometric analysis in a future time. This is an essential uh, part of the orthognathic surgery, working with the dental models. So you always have these assessment of the models include the space analysis and then the arch length. And then we establish the diagnosis from a working problem and then perform a marking, uh, mark, mark surgery uh, by mounting these uh, dental models on the dental working stations. So there are certain surgical principles which are there in the uh, orthognathic surgery. The elements of the facial skeletal can be repositioned, redefining the face through a variety of well-established osteotomies. You can see that Lefort 1, 2, 3 osteotomies, maxillary segmental osteotomies, Sagittal split, vertical ramel, inverted L and C osteotomies, mandibular body and symphysis osteotomies. Now, having said all this, most of the maxillofacial deformities can be managed by basic three basic osteotomies which have stood the test of time. Number one, that is the Lefort 1 osteotomy. Number two, sagittal split. And number three, it is the sliding genioplasty or the chin surgery here. So the horizontal osteotomy of the symphysis of the chin, these three put together can virtually uh, uh, cover 99% of your dentofacial anomalies in the orthognathic surgery. So these are some of the uh, surgical principles in the mid phase. You can see the Lefort 1 going like this, Lefort 2, and then the Lefort 3. These are the osteotomy lines. These are essentially based on same fracture lines which were uh, uh, told and named after the classic uh, lines of weakness due to the fracture denoted by Lefort. So the standard Lefort osteotomies must be modified sometimes uh, to uh, tailor make for the patient's requirement. You can see here, 
that we have done slightly like a quadrilateral type of osteotomy so that the, the piriform aperture is untouched. However, the orbit part of the orbit is uh, you know osteotomized. And in the lower phase, it is the sagittal split ramal osteotomy is the primary choice. And then deformities of the chin can coexist independently or as a small chin or with the mandible itself. So while alloplastic, like you know, the silicon skin implant, I mean uh, chin implant, has virtually uh, lessened the uh, requirement for doing a sliding genioplasty. Still, the uh, sliding horizontal osteotomy of the symphysis is got far more vers versatile procedure and also far more long lasting. These are some of the uh, pre surgical workup phases. It is a pre orthodontic phase, pre surgical orthodontic phase, a surgical phase, a post surgical, and a prosthodontic treatment phase. So these are some of the pre orthodontic in which we treat the poorly attached gingiva prior to the orthodontic tooth movement. Any caries is taken care, and then of course any other uh, endodontic treatment or extraction if it is required, it is done. Pre-surgical orthodontics is an extremely important in which the dental decompensation is necessary to allow for the proper degree of mandibular advancement and for the post-surgical stability of the occlusion pattern. So you must remember when they do the orthodontics preoperatively, the occlusion becomes worse unless until corrected by the skeletal advancement. So one should be ready for that. There's nothing to get psyched out about this. So the next one is the pre-surgical orthodontics, appropriate dental decompensation, alignment of the dentition within the individual arches, leveling of the curve of speed, and then coordination of the maxillary and mandibular dentition for post-operative study. It usually takes about 6 to 18 months, depending on what needs to be accomplished to maximize the final surgical stability of the occlusal level. So this is the uh, two to three weeks prior, we do a dental model and then do the dental uh, mock surgery. So this is the surgical phase. These are the intermediate splint, which are prepared for the bimaxillary surgery. And this is the permanent splint. This is usually in violet color and this is usually in the permanent is in the blue color. That is to give a dental wafer before you do the occlusion pattern. <clears throat> so in a single jaw being reposed, use a final splint to guide yeah. the occlusion and the jaw being moved related to the remaining jaw. You can see that. So first is the dental pattern, 3D analysis, and then the movement, cuts, and then reposition, temporary wafer, and then the final wafer and then the fixation. You can see the moment here which has happened there. So once the maxilla and mandible are in the final position, the chin and, uh, uh, is assessed and then it is performed uh, whether a sliding osteotomy is required or no here. I will go into the little operative details. External reference mark at the nasion to the midline here between the incisors. This is the position to uh, position the maxilla vertically preoperatively as well as postoperatively. You can see the classical gingiva buccal sulcus incision and then it is elevated up to the infraorbital foramen, piriform aperture and then at the anterior nasal spine. The superior exposure must be sufficient to accommodate the fixation plates. They continue the dissection posteriorly to the pterygopalatine region. So this is where we do the pterygopalatine osteotomy to disjunction the maxilla so that it can move forward. This is the first step. Then the next step is this. You mark the <coughs> uh, osteotomy lines. The uh, exposure is usually complete. And then when you want to do the um, osteotomy, there are various variations which will come into the picture. You can use that so that you can tailor the osteotomy to the individual patient. Here you can see that the markings are done on the skeletal where I'm going to do the osteotomy. The third thing is using a uh, separating the nasal septum. That is the nasal septum being separated as well as 
the piriform upper uh, aperture being released from the nasal mucosa there. So the septal osteotomy can be accomplished with a reciprocating saw or a guarded saw. So use a curved osteotome to separate the pterygoid plate from the maxillary junction from the posterior aspect. So this is the horizontal cuts first, which comes, which goes along like this, below the inflammatory foramen, piriform aperture, midline, anterior nasal spine coming onto the opposite side and then into the pterygomaxillary junction. So you can see that the osteotomy is completed. Next, what happens? It is something called as the down fracture. So before doing the down fracture, we have to do the septum, which is there in the center. That also needs to be uh, dissected free and then osteotomized. Otherwise, the maxilla will not come down. So here it is being osteotomized, the central osteotome. And then you can see this on the left side, there is a thing called as the Smith spreader. So you put the blades inside the osteotomy sites and gently spring it open so that the crack starts developing at the uh, uh, <clears throat> osteotomy lines. So once you carefully do it, but you have a very steady hands and then you do it carefully, you can see that alternatively it has come down, the maxilla is down fractured, leaving the posterior aspect of the skull base coming into the view. Here you can also see the palatine artery coming there. If you are not done carefully, so this is the place where you can tear it and then you can cause a lot of bleeding there. So complete the mobilization of the maxilla to passively place it in final position with a pair of forceps. You can see that I have put an intermediate wafer there and then I have achieved the uh, occlusion pattern. And then once the temporary achievement is done, so we have to plan for the fixation of the uh, maxilla. So if the significant inferior maxillary repositioning is present, sometimes the bone graft may have to be used, which I usually harvest either from the cranium or sometimes from the iliac crest. I'm not very fond of using a alloplastic hydroxy appetite, so which is is very popularly used in some of some centers. Here you can see that you know if required we have to do the osteotomy and then a bone graft placement to be done. So now again after you have done that you have to confirm the vertical measurement again whether it is perfect and then once you have done that the maxilla in the desired position whether you have to be impacted or disimpacted and brought forward or moved laterally to cut the cross bite or angular cross bite or a, uh, uh, angular bites need correction at one side more, one side less. So all these things can be, I compare it to a small sort of a drawer. You can open it out and then you can tilt the way you want it. Either you can put it out, you can put it in or you can tilt laterally. So with the maxilla in the desired position, the stabilization is done with plates and screws at the medial and the lateral buttresses. You can see that that is a fixation which is done there. So once it is done, the cantilever screw or sometimes the marking screw, some people put it. I just do a tattoo there and then we remove it. What happens once we do that, there is a flaring of the nostrils at the LR base, which happens because the, and it will give you a very bulbous tip for the nose deformity. So when we do that, what we do is we do a something called as the V to Y closure. That means we have opened it like a V, but we close it, bringing it, these mucosa together and then uh, lengthening the central segment a little bit in the Y fashion. So the final cut will be something like this, closed like a Y. And then in the same setting, a cinch stitch is taken through the two LR base so that the width of the LR base is reduced. So these are some of the uh, fixation tips. Two millimeter plates for maxillary advancement, 1.5 for impactions because not much movement is required. Whereas 2 mm or 2.5 sometimes is required when you are bringing it forward because generally the impactions are better uh, stable position than the forward positions. The plate must lie passively on the bone. Per preformed L-shaped plates, as you can see here, are much better and advantageous. Because if we try to do that, we can do that. But sometimes they can cause a, a implant failure here due to the breakage of this at some, some time. <clears throat> unless it is of a very good quality titanium. 
So locate the plates where the bone is the thicket. So that means it is the nasomaxillary buttress. OK, and then the horizontal buttress near the spine. And then of course the lateral buttress that is the zygomaticum axillary buttress. So four plates are ideal and avoid a very thin bone like anterior cortex. So these are some of the variations which are there. You can see that it is called as the quadrilateral uh, type of flap. It is a standard type and then sometimes it is an inverted one here, leaving the zygomatic body there. And here it is like a gull wing shape wherein it enters into the body of the zygoma. So these are some of the <clears throat> Lifford one variations. You can see that. You can see that this is an impaction in which we have put the maxilla back into the position and then we have jammed it straight. This is the quadrangular one in which a body of the zygoma is also partly astatomized and then brought forward. So pterygoid sparing osteotomy is in which you can do the osteotomy line just behind the teeth instead of going into the fissure. If you go through the fissure, it is you use a curved osteotome and then slowly you do it. But there is a small chance that if you are not careful, you can damage the maxillary artery. So these are the uh, uh, mandibular osteotomies, which, uh, which I will start with the bilateral sagittal split osteotomy, also called as the BSSO. Then the vertical ramus inverted, and then body procedures or anterior and subapical procedures followed by chin procedures. So if you see here, the sagittal split is a very versatile procedure. It can be used for horizontal mandible excess or deficiency, mandibular asymmetry, advancement, setback, and minor asymmetry. Contraindications are very severely decreased posterior body height, severe ramus hypoplasia, severe mandible asymmetry. These patients, especially this patient, it is better to do a distraction and then to get into some sort of a position before instead of doing the sagittal split. So the incision goes like this, the through the periosteum after palpating the margin, exposing the border there and then the first cut is made here. This is how it is done. So the you can see the coronoid retractor is all these instrumentations are mostly done up by Aubegisser. It is his personal modifications. So it is almost a lifetime uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, dedication for this discipline by the great man. So the palpate the ascending ramus and place the mucovestibular incision. You can see that that is the one which is there. And the coronoid is retracted by the lion toothed hook retractor upwards and one to two centimeters above the occlusal plane and then continues to the region of the first molar. It goes up to that place and then so that it comes like this so that you can open the entire segment of bone there. The first thing is the Lindman bar. So you start on the medial cortex. You can see there and then this is the Lindman bar. So you can see that I am starting the cortex there. That is a minor cut. It comes half of this width of this. So this cut is complete. Once the deep osteotomy is deepened, it should be only one half of the thickness of the ramus. You should not do one total cut. Then it becomes a uh, fracture there. Then the next is <clears throat> again this uh, contraangle burr is used to the split of the along the osteodynamic ridge there. So you can see that I am doing that. So up to this place. The tip of the saw should penetrate only to the anterior cortex. You can see that it is more tilted laterally so that if you tilt towards medially, you can injure the inferior alveolar nerve and the artery. Laterally, it is better to do it so that you can reduce the nerve to the injury. So you can see that the lower cut is made now. So the inner cut is made here. The oblique cut is made here and then the lower cut is made near the last molar tooth going up to the border of the mandible there. You can see there very clearly there. Ensure that the vertical osteotomy continues through the inferior mandible border 
to the medial lingual cortex. Otherwise, the split will not happen properly. So once it is done, the osteotomies will be done by carefully doing the osteotom. Uh, four millimeters, I usually do it. And then I usually use the Smith spreader to do it. You can see on the right side that Smith spreader is there. So you just put it into the gap there and then gently keep on springing it open so that it uh, uh, opens the fracture side. And that is the sagittal split. Once the sagittal split is complete, you can see that it is totally it is into two pieces. The care must be taken to maintain the normal fossa and the condylar position because once the split is complete, this is the position in which you'll, usually it gets dislocated. So when you are fixing it, it has to be put back into this position. And then the whether the advancement or the setback, depending on that plate fixation, has to be done. So I usually do the <clears throat> two types of uh, 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 fixations. One is called as the confirmation screws or also called as the positioning screws. So you can see that I usually do the transbuckle instrumentation. It is very comfortable and easier. The other one is the, uh, this is the confirmatory screws there. Minimum of two and preferably three bicortical position screws have to be there. It should not go down because it will injure the nerve. It should be along the upper border like that so that it is there. Some people even do one lower border also here. <clears throat> Whereas a plate can be applied across the segments of the lateral aspect of the mandible using a monocortical screws. You can see there nicely it is there and then it is advanced forward and then it is. Bent. So the reason is bone cuts must be brought forward. There is an increased risk of buccal plate fracture. You can see that it should be bicortical, but unfortunately this is thin and this is thinned out because of the sagittal split. So if you're not careful when you're doing the drilling, it can cause a buccal plate fracture. This is one of the cases in which you can see that <coughs> the, the small chin and then a sliding, uh, I mean, um, the occlusion there like that. So the mandible are split and then the BSSO is done and it is good result. So how does it helps? It helps in an adequate fast bony healing, advanced setback or the rotate of the mandible within the limits. Occlusion plane can be altered as I told you, just like maxilla. There is no need to strip the muscles of mastications, especially the masseter or even for that matter anteriorly. So a bit of technically challenging, you should always say, keep the inferior alveolar nerve in the back of your mind. And it is extremely difficult to correct the large asymmetry and discrepancies, which I already told you in the last slide. In a case like this, in which very severe maxillary hypoplasia, as well as severe prognathism of the mandible, it is better to do a vertical ramus osteotomy. It's a much simpler procedure compared to a... And <clears throat> what are the contraindications? Any previous fractures in and around that area? And aesthetic assessment of the facial soft tissues will tell you whether to do it or no. Here you can see that the occlusion is totally uh, gone uh, weird and then the mandible is really, it requires to be put back. Solved, it also requires a bimaxillary surgery because the maxilla also needs to come forward. Mandible has to go back. And then uh, these are the areas, especially when it is more than eight millimeters, it is better to do the um, uh, reverse uh, vertical ramus osteotomy. Here I've done the vertical ramus osteotomy and then I fixed it up and then done the maxillary osteotomy and then done the leaf foot one advancement. So that is his final uh, appearance. You can see that actually the inverted uh, uh, mandible osteotomy, you can see it is like a long strip of the bone condyle in position, mandible has gone back. Maxilla is advanced out into the thing. You can see the previous radiograph and the current radiograph, and that is his profile. <coughs> So vertical ramus osteotomy, when do you consider? You consider when it is more than seven millimeter moment, less chance of narrow damage, obviously because you are going much behind the uh, uh, in the mandible. There is a decreased chance of the condylar sac and technically fairly easier to perform. It will leave into another one. It's called the IOL, uh, ILO, sorry, called the inverted L osteotomy, in which a severe prognathism following especially the 
cleft, wherein you have a cleft related problems, maxillary hypoplasia is there, mandible horizontal discrepancy is more than 20 millimeter, so you can't really do a sagittal split in these cases. So best is to do the uh, inverted L osteotomy for this. So that is how it is done. You can see that the uh, L osteotomy is done like that. That is the lingual foramen, and then the mandible is pushed back. This condyle moves forward, and then you have got a significant amount of reduction in the length. So, if you are planning to do an advancement, you may require a bone graft. If the poor approximation of the fragments is there, when the grafts are not used, so that is why it has got a small incidence of an increased healing time. Now there are few caveats which I will talk to you in that um, inverted L osteotomy and then inverted V osteotomy and BSSO. Rigid fixation is difficult to apply, less predictable control of the condylar position. However, BSSO is the workhorse. It is excellent for horizontal discrepancies, single mini plate fixation, and most suitable for discrepancy more than 8 millimeters, consider a IVRO or a ILO. Sliding genioplasty, I told you, it becomes as the chin uh, <clears throat> silicone implants have come into picture. This procedure has become a little less compared to what we used to do earlier. So this allows for the narrowing of the chin, and then you can see the split, and then you can do the widening. All these things can be done with a sliding genioplasty. The incision is through the gingival buccal incision, and then through the bar we do the osteotomy below the mental foramen here, and then the bone is slide forward and then fixed with the inverted L plate or pre pre bent plates like this, which will come so that you can keep it in position. In a case of a secondary cleft lip nose deformity patients. The surgeon and orthodontist must carefully consider the preoperative clinical findings and cephalometric studies when planning the procedure. One of the most important thing is, if you see all these cleft lip and palate patients, they would have achieved an excellent uh, speech by a good palatal procedure. Now, if you try to do any uh, maxillary advancement, most of the times they will land up in doing a VPI, that is a velopharyngeal incompetence. So it is always better to plan if it is possible to do a inverted L or probably a uh, mandibular setback. <laughs> so <laughs> the upper gingival buccal incision is modified to allow the closure of the nasal floor and the palatal defect. So these are some of the post operative. Uh, uh, management, airway management, obtain an OPG post-operative period early to ensure that the condyles are in the appropriate position. If the condyles are displaced, the anterior bite happens. There is no way you can escape that. You can't put rubber bands and try to reduce it. Just take the patient back to the surgery OT and redo the osteosynthesis. Otherwise, it is not going to uh, give you a good result. So the uh, maintenance of the rubber bands and gliding dental elastics for a varying period of about four to eight weeks and provide a close follow up with the patients. Post of orthodontics, I told you, without their help, you are nowhere in these procedures. Now, these are some of the uh, final phase in which there is a placement of the dental implants, prosthetic and periodontal treatment, dental restoration to improve the dental aesthetics. Complications, these are some of the complications which are nominated. And uh, fortunately, if carefully analyzed and carefully done uh, procedures, the complications rates are very, very less by God's grace. So posterior wall, if it is cut superiorly and pterygomaxillary disjunction, you can have a bleed from the, uh, the maxillary artery. You have to do the packing and very rarely you have to do a selective embolization. So these are some of the uh, thing. Avascular necrosis is a disaster. Fortunately, I haven't seen one, but yes, I've seen many of these things in mucor mycosis. So it's a pure <coughs> uh, avascular necrosis of the maxilla which can happen. If you are not a uh, properly designed flaps and tearing of the flaps when you are elevating the flaps, 
or loss of uh, you know the blood supply due to segmental or the entire maxilla can go off so better to do a careful dissection of the vascular pedicle septal deviation it can happen when impaction of the lifold one osteotomy so if it is more than 3 mm you have to reject the septum if it is less then you have to do the trim of this or the burring of the spurs can be done or a groove can be done in the maxilla so that the caudal portion of the septum will come and sit there these are some of the complications nasal septum deviation you can see that it is corrected you can correct it by an only uh, bone graft and a rhinoplasty in a second stage so lifold outcome is a workhorse procedure allows any movement of the maxilla good planning and indications principles fixations and a good adherence to all these will reduce the number of complications sagittal split again same story is combined injury to the inferior alveolar nerve and uh, bleeding because of the inferior alveolar artery so some of the <clears throat> open bite mal occlusion relapse these things happen if they are not properly fixed now these are some of the cases of uh, facial asymmetry which we have done in the period of time so you can see that pre orthodontic dentics and then surgery and then post following post orthodontics that is the uh, um, craniofacial microsomia this is another case in which there is a uh, Uh, total dmj hypoplasia in which we have done the distraction and then we have done the movement of the sagittal split at a later stage this is one of the most difficult one in which you can do an scant in the slant in the cant they say where the occlusal cant is a little bit difficult so you can see that that is how it will look and uh, bsso comes very good in these procedures and maxillary osteotomy and then inverted l which we did for this patient it worked out very well so it is this is how the procedure is done and giving a good results that's another case of a maxillary hypoplasia and then uh, uh, these are some of the corrective surgeries done that is the uh, from the cranium we have harvested the bone grafts done the um, impaction there and then mandible maxilla and then below the orbit it is put there the uh, bone grafts so that is how the facial asymmetry is tried to correct for these patients so successful surgical outcome depends on the accurate diagnosis growth monitoring and well planned surgery deformity can occur in the chin mid face maxilla and mandible by maxillary surgery is more common than appear to be less severe treatments in untreatable with one jaw usually we have to do both deformities of both jaws more prone to the relapse complex three dimensional movements are involved with all these procedures so hence a proper planning and then execution of the surgery is important long term evaluation is extremely crucial for these patients so there are multitude of factors which will uh, uh, happen before long before the surgery and the control of the variables long after the surgical procedures so inadequate incisor decompensation limits the amount of sagittal repositioning and then compromises the final aesthetics so if mobilization of the maxilla at the time of surgery is inadequate obtaining a less than ideal occlusion relation the post surgical orthodontic phase is prolonged and the likelihood of relapse is more so with any skeletal movement the surgeon always must be aware of the potential for relapse even in the most ideal situation and with the use of rigid internal fixation soft tissue forces directed again especially in cleft lip uh, nose operated ones against the vector of the surgical movements are extremely significant so generally the most stable moves are superior and posterior that is maxillary impactions and mandibular setbacks advancement of the maxilla whether vertically or sagittally or inherently less stable compared to the mandibular advancement so i thank everybody the credit
sir, to my senior colleague, Dr. Kumar, who is now a chancellor in uh, SDM, Dr. Ashok and uh, Dr. Srikan, my colleagues, Dr. Gopal Krishnan and Dr. Achit Baliga, they are from SDM Dental College. So they have been the maxillofacial surgeons. Dr. Sadashiv Shetty is the orthodontic man. Because of these, we could achieve many of these cases done in great style. Thank you very much. Any questions is there? I can, I'm there okay for it. <laughs> Thanks, Lakshmi. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, Thank much, you very sir. much, sir. Thank you. It's a, a great uh, lecture, sir. Actually, uh, uh, how much it is uh, important to, to correct the deformities of uh, the face and the approach yeah. to the condition uh, along with the maxillofacial and uh, orthodontic uh, 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 surgeons. It's a team approach to correct the, uh, these uh, deformities. Uh, very few people has uh, the experience of uh, uh, this field and uh, yes. your lecture is an iconic lecture and I uh, definitely think many uh, PGs and uh, the young plastic surgeons uh, will get benefit out of your uh, lecture because you have covered very well all aspects of uh, the orthognathic surgery and uh, I would like to ask a few questions, sir. And we come across uh, uh, these uh, hemifacial microsomia cases and uh, uh, TMJ ankylosis uh, in the late phase. A few uh, cases you have shown. Na? So you prefer to go for uh, the distraction initially and uh, uh, correction uh, later with the uh, orthognathic surgery, isn't yeah, yeah. it, sir? Yeah, yeah, because most of these uh, TMJ hypoplasias, the bone quality will be very poor, especially in the posterior segment near yes. the condyle ascending ramus. It will not be well developed at all. So you have to do a distraction, allow it to grow up and then plan probably for the osteotomy procedures at a later date. Yeah. And uh, uh, like uh, how much uh, di uh, distraction and the movement we'll get with the distractors, sir, and yeah. uh, followed by orthognathic. So, <clears throat> see, easily about uh, two centimeters in the vertical uh, um, uh, vector, and about one point five to yes. two centimeters in the horizontal vector, we can get it by uh, you know distractions. It's Beyond that, when okay. we want to do that, we have to do the uh, the sliding aspects. That is the, we can either plan for inverted L osteotomies so that the mandible itself moves forward. And then in these craniofacials, sometimes we may have to do a bone augmentation on the lateral border of the mandible, like an only yes. bone. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. So uh, they require almost multiple <coughs> uh, aspects and uh, exactly. procedures. Exactly. Craniofacial microsomia, soft tissues, bony component, each is a separate subject by itself to do the uh, yes, you know, discussion. Mm. Yes, uh, when you plan uh, by uh, maxillary advancements, uh, uh, will you decide the uh, how much has to be done <coughs> on the maxilla and the mandible based yes. on this uh, three cuts, sir, mainly? Yeah, yeah. Usually we have uh, to plan uh, the dental models. Um, yes, uh, we have to know how much maxilla has to be moved and how much is the mandible mm -hmm. has to be moved. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank we you. We invite uh, you. the seniors, uh, if they want to contribute, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, sir, Dr. Uh, Sunil, sir, and, uh, and Dr. Y.V. Rao, uh, you people can share the your experiences or uh, uh, ask your questions. I can see Dr. Umar also. Hi. Yes, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Hi, sir. Dr. Umar. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Hi. Hi. Hi fine, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, sir. sir, my query was, is Thank there you. any role of 3D printing? 
Yeah, yeah. In fact, I told you in the first uh, few slides itself, because uh, 3D printing has become fairly uh, now cost effective. Available, About yeah. uh, two to three thousand rupees, they can give a adequate size of a uh, 3D model, plasticine model, which you can uh, do a mock surgery on that. Yeah, not very expensive at all. Yes, sir. Yeah. The second thing, how do you decide about putting a bone graft? For example, if you decide a leaf foot one osteotomy, is there any limit? If yeah. we have a movement of four five mm, then I will not put a graft. Or if it exceeds six mm or like that, I have to. Put Usually, a graft. my uh, cutoff rule is around six mm. <clears throat> See, up to about uh, four to six mm body, uh, the especially the draping periosteum has got a highest uh, osteogenic potential. It can uh, grow back. The moment it crosses more than four to six millimeters, so then it is better to put a wedging uh, bone graft into it. Four millimeter, I mean, a six millimeter to eight millimeter bone graft is not big. You can uh, easily place a wedge there. Yeah, it's not very big. Because otherwise the relapse is very common. If you don't do the wedging of the, uh, you know, the bone graft, so the relapse of the uh, uh, deformity happens very fast because the occlusion forces are so strong, especially in the uh, zygomatico maxillary butter buttress area, which carries about 80% of the load. So it just pulls it back uh, like in a fraction of a month actually. So all your hard work, you feel that you know where it has gone. So the soft forces are really, really strong. And uh, it even uh, I have seen uh, bending of the plates which will happen. You know the uh, advanced uh, plates which we have put there. Yeah. <clears throat> Sir, any tips regarding that the vascularity should remain intact? Especially yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's what I usually do the uh, terigo maxillary disjunction in a very careful math manner. First is I will complete all the uh, uh, front osteotomies, that is the horizontal osteotomies. Second step, I will do the septal osteotomy with a guarded osteotome. And then slowly I down fracture it. After I down fracture the semi, then I go back to the uh, terigo maxillary junction. In the terigo maxillary junction, I use a curved osteotome. I do a curved osteotome and gently tap it dry so that you know it's like a proper maxillectomy in how they do a cancer surgery. So it just slowly comes off. Yeah. If you are not careful there, you can cause bleeding. But if I got it correctly, there was one slide showing that. You are now doing that. You are not going to the terigo maxillary fissure. No, you I, still do, the, uh, I still do that. I still do the terigo maxillary fissure disjunction because yes, it's sir. still easier if you do it with a longer osteotome and do it very carefully. Because so no need because to go the, anteriorly. Anteriorly, the tubercle, if you have to cut through, you have to cut through. Really, that osteotomy takes long time. Yeah, it is a very because thick bone. It's in front of the, <clears throat> it's a thick bone. The posterior. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So terigo maxillary buttress is a very weak buttress. You can gen, just uh, very carefully have to do it. If you carefully do it, I have not had any problems that way. It's quite good. And what about the sir, nasal septum? Nasal Taking septum, I should. Yeah, I always do a guarded no, osteotum. You have to do it. You have to do it. I Otherwise, it won't down fracture. It won't or not move. It won't. Yeah. And uh, when you do an impaction uh, osteotomy, that means uh, when you're pushing it back, for various uh, you know efforts, so <clears throat> the septum buckles. That's why I showed you that there is a corrective septal rhinoplasty needs to be done maybe at a time later. So after the orthognathic surgery is done, occlusion looks fine, everything is looks fine, but the nose starts looking bent because the septum is deviated. The caudal portion which was there long hanging down now it is impacted upwards. So it just uh, buckles and then gives a very wrong appearance for the nose. So that is why the caudal portion can be rejected or the groove can be made in the maxillary, you know, anterior nasal spine so that it sits there. If it is not much, then you have to do a corrective septorinoplasty with an only bone graft, which I usually, which I, that is what I showed you in that uh, girl's photograph, if you remember. Yes. <clears throat> it was really, a uh, madam was saying iconic, it was really iconic lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a team effort. Yeah. I always say that. <laughs> I need to watch it again. <laughs> Thank because you. It is record, recorded. We'll watch it again.
to become yes, more. Yes, sir. We have to go through the lecture uh, once again and uh, twice. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I also think yes. the same. I also think the same. Yes, sir. Because uh, uh, yeah, you have nicely covered in the slides all the aspects, uh, yeah, though you right. explained the important points. <laughs> yeah, very exhaustively. And one more thing, sir, in your uh, uh, maxillary, by uh, maxillary, maxilla mandible uh, uh, corrections, if you in total advance the maxilla, uh, is there any possibility of uh, development of uh, uh, valopharyngeal incompetence? Exactly. <laughs> that is the one thing which will happen in uh, especially cleft lip uh, patients, cleft lip palate yes, patients sir. operated. Yes. If you see these patients also, they will have something called as the uh, secondary cleft lip nose deformity. So yes. the maxillary hypoplasia is there. Whereas the mandible is normal in these patients. Yes. So mandible is normal, but it appears mandible is prognathic because of the associated uh, hypoplasia of the maxilla. Yes. Sir. Now, there is a uh, way how to go about it. If actually speaking, the maxilla has to be brought forward to the level of mandible, ideally speaking. Yes. Orthognathically, yes. principally speaking, I have to bring back, the, do the Elifort 1 osteotomy and then bring it back to the normally grown mandible, correct? Yes, but sir. if I do that, you will invariably land up in doing a, 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 a willopharyngeal incompetence. Yes. Because the movement is definitely more than 4 to 6 millimeters anteriorly. So yeah. if you do that, definitely you will end up in doing a willopharyngeal incompetence, which yeah. is a great trade-off actually for a person after the surgery to have a speech, you know, all these years, 18 years, he has got a good speech and suddenly you say that you can't speak properly. My God, it is a disaster. Yeah. So yes. cleft lip nose deformity patients, I always take the mandible setback as the first case. Oh. I don't touch upon uh, maxillary hypoplasia at all. I do the mandible setback and then if required, I do a sliding genioplasty or a small chin augmentation there. You can even put on small bone graft to the chin. So the facial profile gets corrected. Okay, then I go and do the composite uh, uh, correction of the secondary cleft lip nose deformity. That means I will do the alveolar cleft bone grafting. I will do the <clears throat> premaxillary hypoplasia bone grafting, cancellous bone chips, Only. the rhinoplasty. It is the open tip rhinoplasty, septum correction, rhinoplasty collection, and then uh, dorsal uh, bone augmentation. Everything will be done in one stage. And sometimes I do the scar revision. And if it is required, uh, upper lip uh, lipophil also I do it. So it, all in all, I put together, it's about uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 10, 12 procedures which are done in one setting in that. Mm -hmm. So I don't usually post any other case on that day. Only this case I do right from 7.30 to 2 o'clock. Three o'clock. Yeah. Sir, one thing more, sir. Do you think it is superior bone graft if we take it from the cranial bone, cranial bone graft? Not necessary, sir, actually. Are... I have yes, seen sir. both uh, uh, the three qualities. That is the inner cortex of the alveolar, uh, uh, you know, on the iliac crest. It's equally yeah. good, and um, rib is equally good, and uh, cranium is equally good. Actually, cranium is easier to harvest. Is it easier? That is what I, that I, was my, that was my question because we are not frequently and usually taking the grafts from I, the cranium. I, I showed my you that. My point was: Is it uh, easier to harvest cranial bone graft or iliac? What you usually take? See, by it depends on your thickness of the bone. If you want only outer cortex of the, the bone of the skull, it is easier to do it from the skull. It doesn't take much time actually. You take the coronal incision? Coronal incision. Coronal incision. Coronal incision. Coronal incision. Always. Coronal. Yes. Yes. Bicoronal and from ear to ear. Bicoronal. Ear to ear. Yes. Ear to ear. So usually we are not taking, we are not usually taking. So <laughs> it might be a little bit cumbersome for us and we are taking the very fond of eye-leg bone graft. Eye-leg bone I is a very suitable bone. You, it gives yes. you, uh, you know, inner cortex is extremely good. You can take yes. that. And then the cancellous bone graft is also quite a, quite a bit, uh, it comes there. I think it is yeah. more than sufficient. Even I do it actually. I like crest, I also do it. Like today's uh, case, I did one binder syndrome. So uh, 
uh, I did the same thing. Actually, I harvested the uh, cartilage from the near the you know chest incision uh, because I have to build up the septum, which was non-existent in that. Then I have to do a columnar strut. Then I have to put a um, uh, um, uh, one cortical a cartilage strut over the dorsum of the nose as a stacked bone graft from the iliac crest. So all in all, it took about uh, <laughs> it finished around four, four o'clock today. So it, it, this happens actually. Yeah. These are long, also long surgeries. These are long surgeries. Long one should be prepared for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One should not look at the clock. One should look at the calendar. Right. Only right. the results. Only the results. The results will come. <laughs> But Ajay, sir, is it? Uh, he is not to be seen. I oh. think uh, uh, sir has covered very nicely all aspects. So, <laughs> sir, actually, one PG prepared to present the case, but uh, okay. he had some uh, problem at family emergency, okay. so uh -huh. could not uh, present, sir. Next time, uh, <laughs> next time we'll uh, plan it. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Yeah. So when she requested, when she called, told me, why don't you cover orthognathic? It was a little difficult for me also. Then I suddenly realized over a period of 30 years, I have done fairly some amount of uh, surgeries for this so that I can stand and then talk about these procedures. So it's not bad that way. Yes. Wonderful really, talk. it is a wonderful lecture, sir, yeah. and uh, nicely covered. Uh, yeah. And taking mainly the plastic surgeon's perspective. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I return it as a plastic surgeon's perspective because most of the times you are a bony man. So here, yes. <laughs> there is no consideration for soft issues and appearance. Yes. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank and you. Uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Omar. It is an iconic lecture, and uh, the PGs will be benefited. Thank and you. many people they are uh, uh, expressing uh, that uh, all uh, faculty they are taking time and uh, uh, yeah. helping them in exams. And thank I thank a lot uh, uh, for uh, sparing your valuable time. No and problem. good evening, sir. And uh, we'll meet once again in uh, future uh, sessions. Okay.